Let's, uh, let's get to baptism then. So baptism is a Greek word. It's pronounced baptismus in Greek. So it is simply a, a Greek word, and it means literally to wash, to wash. Um, I have a couple of bullet points. I think you have most of these on your sheets. But the baptism of John is no different from the baptism Jesus commands in Matthew 8, 28. We are all baptized into one body, which is Christ and the body of believers. Also Ephesians, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. It is not to be obscured by Acts 19, 3 and 4. And how about if I just read that to you? But th this usually comes up, so I thought I'll just head it off and we'll do that. So Paul, this, um, Paul had met um, the super preacher, Apollos. And Apollos is now in Corinth, and then Paul goes and meets some other people. And that's where he bumps into this notion of whose baptism did you get? Okay? But, and so Paul asked, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. And Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. Paul explains the baptism you got wasn't at fault, but there was some false doctrine or you missed something. That's in your understanding that's wrong. Um, and so um, that was their misunderstanding. It wasn't a flaw in the baptism. If there were a flaw in John's baptism, then who was baptized incorrectly? Jesus and all of his apostles. Yeah, um, but no there's, no, there's no difference. The only, the only real difference, if you're going to look at differences carefully, and this is uh, something I got this morning reading John Gerhardt, who lived in the 1600s, is that, um, and he, I think he got it from Anselm um, back in the 300s or whenever Anselm lived, but, um, and that is John's baptism technically looked ahead to Christ, whereas Christ and the apostles and we today look back to Christ. So um, it, that's just a matter of perspective that you would expect because of the timing of John's baptism as opposed to the, uh, what I'll call the, apost the apostles' baptism or something like that. But baptism is a baptism of repentance, especially emphasizing the grasping of Christ's forgiveness through faith. Yes, Beth. We're coming to that. That's the rest of this chapter. He, that's, we just haven't gotten to that verse yet. Um, because there's also a question of, is that talking about Pentecost or Judgment Day? That's, there's, that's where we're going with that. But let, let's get to verse 9 a little bit later. Um, so the, the words of baptism, what do we say? Well, the name of God. We baptize in the name of, correctly. The, I suppose it's the irony that Jesus in the final verses of Matthew's gospel says baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then he ascends into heaven. And what do they turn around and do in Acts chapter 1? They baptize in the name of Jesus. So Jesus gives them one formula and then they shorten it immediately? Or is that just uh, uh, something about the way that Luke records things? Because is there a difference between professing Christ and professing the triune God if you're a first century Christian? No, not really. It's an understanding that Christ is the second person of the Trinity. To deny Christ would be to deny the Trinity. There's no real problem there with do we use the name of God or the name of Christ or the name of the triune God. When we baptize, we prefer to do it in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit because those are the words Jesus gives us in the commission. Um, and, there, and therefore we do that. And it, by the way, wouldn't matter what language we did it in. Um, but to do it in the vernacular is, is, is preferred. Um, but the words, um, when I teach the kids uh, about baptism in catechism class, oh, I didn't bring him. I should have brought out Winnie the Pooh. He's in my, many of you have seen my giant Winnie the Pooh doll. Um, so uh, we, I, uh, because baptism can be done in an emergency by any Christian, we're going to talk about this later also, um, I want our young Christians to learn how to do it because when I first came to St. Paul's, we taught that, and then I, I had a young person call me a couple years later 
who said, how do I baptize? And I said, I told you that in class. And he said, I don't remember. And I thought, I got to demonstrate this. So what I did was I grabbed a Raggedy Ann doll uh, from, the, from the nursery. Um, she, got, she ended up just getting used too much, I think. So I've gone to a Winnie the Pooh doll now. But we actually grabbed the big Winnie the Pooh doll. Every single child holds the, the Pooh doll. And they say, Winnie the Pooh, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit too. So it rhymes. And they, and, they, and they get his head soaking wet with water. And the last kid, it's just dripping everywhere. So we go through a couple of towels as well so that they remember. And I also had a young man call me a couple of years ago saying, thank you, Pastor. I had to baptize my son in the hospital. And he said, and I got to tell you, Pastor, I almost called him Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> so, so, but, and, and, and then I reminded him, that, you know, uh, you, you, uh, uh, you don't have to, the baby doesn't have to have a name yet to be baptized. Also, did you know that in the first year of life, a parent can legally change their baby's name without it costing any money? So if, 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 if the parents, you know, are, are having a weird week and they name their daughter, you know, cloudy day or something or whatever, they can say, you know, maybe Claudia would be nicer and they can, they can change. It doesn't cost any money up to, up to your th uh, day 364. They can change the name with no, with no charge. Um, uh, but uh, and, but if, a, if, a, if a minister gets the name wrong during the baptism, does the baptism still take? Yes, yes of course it does. God knows. Um, the Lord um, not only works... Uh, 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 through pastors and Christians, he also works despite us, doesn't he? Because I know I make mistakes. So to be baptized in God's name is to be baptized not by man, but by God himself. It is his name being placed on us. And to be saved through baptism is nothing else than to be delivered from sin, death, and the devil, the three great enemies no, the three, that's the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. But we also have the, this, this other way of talking about our final enemies, which is sin, death, and the devil. And to enter into the kingdom of Christ, to live with him forever. The great comfort of baptism, especially infant baptism, is that you know that the sins have been washed away by Jesus. What about the comfort for the, the couple who loses a child uh, to miscarriage? Well, there is comfort, isn't there? Um, because we know a couple of things. Uh, God does not limit himself to baptism, although he gives that to us as a means to work through. Also, God works through the gospel. Baptism and the Lord's Supper and the preaching of the word are three ways that the means of grace come to us. But that also includes the preaching of the word. So when the mother sits on the edge of her bed and says her Lord's Prayer or her Apostles' Creed or even her Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep and or, or reads the, 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 the Bible out loud or the couple talks about it at the dinner table or as she simply comes to worship week by week, um, she hears that gospel. Does, does sound travel through water? Yes, it does. Therefore, does it travel through amniotic fluid? Yes. Um, I was listening to uh, the end uh, last Saturday as I was preparing my sermon. Um, I went finally for lunch around 3 o'clock, and um, uh, the Owatonna station plays Casey Kasem's American Top 40, which I have them all recorded, but I still listen to it when it's on the radio because I'm a big Casey Kasem fan. Anyway, um, it was uh, 1980, and Casey was talking about uh, that in a, a city in Michigan somewhere, um, the, the Grateful Dead had played. No, not the Grateful Dead. Uh, Pink Floyd had played and had accidentally killed all of the fish in a, in a, in a, in a pond because their speakers had sent the sound into the water and the concussion had killed every fish. And, they, they, and, and so Pink Floyd had to re Re, restock, thank you, restock, the, which they did, you know, but uh, 
restocked the lake because they killed all of them. Because yes, sound travels through water. Um, so, and if sound travels, the gospel travels. Um, the person who receives these gifts is the one who believes. Baptism is not our work, but God's work in us, which also gives the faith it offers. Baptism is a treasure which God gives us and that faith grasps. Um, so we do a favor, of, I mean, if you can call it that, for our children when we baptize them as well as anybody else. It was almost 20 years ago, and some of you may have been in this room with me, that a woman at this time burst through those two glass doors, interrupted the Bible class, and said, Pastor, do you baptize? Were any of you here for that? I'm kind of, I remember that Les and June Ring were here and Dave Bauer's parents were here and uh, Herb and Joanne Wolf were here and some others, but um, uh, they, she, she came in and she said, I have a tumor the size of a, I forgot what basketball sized thing this was. And she said, I've never been baptized. Would you baptize me before my surgery? And I said, of course I will. When's your surgery? And she said, in 90 minutes. And I, I, and I said, class, we have to do this right now. I can't let this wait. Would you mind coming with us? And I sent up one of the ladies to, who was on the altar committee, and I think it was June Ring, to go up and, and, uh, and, to, take, and to get Mr. Shoppy come and take the cover off the font and put in uh, room temperature water. How do you tell room temperature water, former mothers? With your elbow. Yeah, thank you, Dad. And uh, with, your, with, yeah, with your elbow. Teach that in class too. Um, and then, and normally I told the woman, I, I said, normally with an adult, we teach first and then baptize. With a baby, normally we baptize first then teach. It's fine. Uh, but I had the walk from here up the steps, down the hallway into the church to teach her. So I taught her at least what's happening in baptism. Um, and then did baptize her. And the class was the witness to the baptism. Um, and then, I, and then I, I, I had them shut down things in here and I went to the hospital and kept talking to her and praying with her and, and with her husband. And when she came, and then I went home. I came back because I knew about when she was going to come out of recovery. And when she came out of recovery, she thought I had been there for nine hours with her. I had to tell her, no, I wasn't here the whole time. I just, <laughs> just came back. And, but then I went through, I went to their apartment. They lived down in those days by the, near the, the bowling alley. Um, and the, where the bowling alley is now, not this one, but, um, uh, and uh, I taught, and week after week, I went through the whole adult class and more, um, and, uh, and, and so she was also confirmed and got communion and so forth. So, but it, that took a long time. And then uh, there's a lot about infant baptism in the large catechism. Do any of you have a large catechism? Do you have one? It's in the book of Concord. I also want to read this passage because some people kind of forget that it's there. But Colossians 2 connects baptism and circumcision. When did circumcision happen? On the eighth day. And baptism for infants, you know, uh, is, is, is a similar issue. And they're both the entry point of a person into the family of God. This is what Paul says in Colossians 2. In him you were also circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Uh, this is also why in the, in the ancient church, baptisms were often done on one Sunday of the year only. Yeah, Saturday night before Easter. On that night, they would do baptisms. Um, and in fact, for a while, because uh, Christians were persecuted in the, in, in the, especially the second and third centuries, um, the idea of godparents came into being because sometimes the Romans would send in spies. I'd like to become a Christian. 
And then he would find out who all the Christians are. And so Christians did a couple of things. They began to hold their communion services apart from their regular Sunday morning services. Often communion was Sunday morning only, whereas that was communion, whereas the regular church service was Saturday night, like the Jews were having their synagogue services. The Christians would do it at the same time. And then baptisms, though, you had to be um, a catechumen and learn for a year with a sponsor before you were ready for, and they figured a Roman spy wouldn't hang out for a year. And so then you would, on Saturday night before Easter, they would bring out all the catechumens in their white robes and they would be baptized. We have a couple of those ancient baptistries. They're often just a little, um, I'm going to call it a kiddie pool. You know, one brick tall in a circle with a pavement. And the pavement often so, shows um, John and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. You know, but that's what the pavement, that's why we know it's a baptistry. Otherwise, it's just a little ring in the floor of what was probably a, an early, the basement of an early Christian church or something like that. So, um, just going to read the bullet I have. Uh, uh, circumcision was commanded on the eighth day, but almost all circumcisions that are described in the Bible are of grown men, right? How many circumcisions do you remember that are of, actually of children? I don't know how old Gershom was when Moses, actually Moses' wife circumcised him, but maybe not, but maybe, maybe a young man. Yeah, that was her name. Yeah, mm-hmm. Or Sephra, depending on your pronunciation skills. Yeah, that's the same name. Zipporah and Sephra. No, they, that's what I just said. They could, we don't know how old they were. Um, uh, but uh, then you also have um, uh, Abraham's uh, other son, Ishmael, but we know that he was a teenager when he got circumcised. So, um, so similarly, baptism is commanded for all, yet without distinction of gender. But the only woman we see baptized in the entire Bible is Lydia. As far as we, unless the jailer of Philippi had a wife, you know, there might be a couple of others, but they're not named. Uh, but we know that women were baptized, but she's the only one where we have a definite passage. Um, and then the only time we read a hint that families or households, including probably children, are baptized is likewise in either Lydia's home or the jailer at Philippi, where you have the word household being, being brought forward. Um, so the, uh, an argument against the bapti baptism of infants is almost the same as an argument against the baptism of women. You know, because you have as little support for that, and yet there is support. Um, baptism is to be done by applying water. I wanted to get to this especially today. By saying the name of Jesus or of the triune God, and then how do you apply the water? Well, Baptism is an application of water by any matter, dip, dunk, or sprinkle, which was the title of a paper I wrote at the, at the seminary. Um, immerse is not inherent to the meaning of the, of the word baptize in Greek. So uh, uh, immersion that the Reformed, especially Baptists and um, some other evangelicals like the Pentecostals will insist upon, not insisted upon by scripture. I want to read a couple of these passages. Two of them are from the Apocrypha, but they're written in Greek, and so we do have the word baptized there. Um, and uh, certainly, certainly, certainly valid to use the Apocrypha to, to look at the use uh, uh, and grammar of a Greek word. But let's look especially at these first two from the Gospels. So in Mark 7, you have this parenthetical aside. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial what? Awesome. Baptism. This is the word baptism. Holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come home from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they baptize. And they observe many other traditions, such as the baptizing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Kettles here would be like the big what, what's, what's the big uh, the big one you cook the corn in in the summer? It's black with white flecks on it. What do you call that one? Canning. A canning? The canning kettle or, the canning kettle or yeah, what have you. So that big thing. Um, 
I do not have a dishwasher in my house that does not look like my own reflection in the mirror. <laughs> so how do I wash a big old kettle like that? Do I immerse it? No. Where would I immerse it? Even my bathtub's not big enough. Um, so no, I, I wash it by putting it in the dishwater and turning it, right? I just wash it. And I cheat and use a sprayer anyway. But, um, <clears throat> but also, this, this verse even has, do you know this verse has a footnote? Because there's a textual variant here. Because some ancient manuscripts add the word dining couches here. And if some ancient Christians thought that dining couches fit the context, then they believed that you could wash a dining couch. Do you immerse your couch? No. No. Every time I bring that up in catechism class, I get a kid who says, you could, we could take our couch down to the river. Like, Would your mother want your couch to be washed in the, in, the, in, the, in the Minnesota River? You know, what would it come out smelling like? And yeah. Then there's this one, Luke 11, 38. But the Pharisee, noticing that Jesus did not first baptize before the meal, was surprised. What kind of washing is this? Hygienic. No, it's not hygienic. This is ceremonial washing. This is dipping your fingers up to the first knuckle in a stone water jar, in a rain barrel outside the house. It's just dipping your finger in and flicking the, the water off three times. That's a ceremonial washing. And Jesus walks in without doing that because ceremonial washing is no longer a requirement. In Christ, none of the Old Testament law applies, including ceremonial washing. Then you have a case where there probably is an immersion. He went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. Who's that? Oh, Naaman. Naaman the Syrian. Yeah, would you be happy if you lived downstream that a leper was taking seven baths upstream from you? Oh, delightful. So happy. And then you've got this one from Judith in the Apocrypha. Um, Holofernes commanded his guards not to hinder her and she remained in the camp for three days but went out each night, I think it should be but, but went out each night uh, to the valley of Bethulia and bathed at the spring in the camp. I think that was her giving herself a ritual but thorough bath also, a ceremonial bathing. So that one could be an immersion. But then you have this one in Sirach. This is another apocryphal book of wisdom. Um, Ecclesiasticus 3430. If one washes after touching a corpse and touches it again, what has been gained by the washing? And this would be ceremonial washing again. Okay? So in, in some cases... It probably certainly is an immersion, but in other cases, not necessarily. And would John have baptized by immersion in the Jordan River? It depends entirely on what month it is. Because in, some, in, 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 in winter and spring, it's at flood stage. But in the summer, it's, it's so low that Ruth and Naomi can walk across without having to worry about Naomi's age or health or slipping on the stones at the ford above the, above the crossing at Jericho. Because remember, they were going back and forth from, from Moab to Bethlehem, and that's where their crossing is, right, right, right there. So, all right. So baptism is to be done once and need not be done again. Who baptizes over and over and over again? The Baptists. Sure. Youth group meeting in a Baptist church is let's all get baptized again. I've been, I've been saved 12 times, Reverend. You know, that's, you know that, that's what you get when that happens. Um, on, however, baptism, and I'm going to use the word done again in parentheses or in quotes, I should say, because unless false doctrine obscured the first baptism as it did in Acts 19 or baptisms by the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. If there's no faith in Christ and no preaching of Christ, there's no gospel there, right? Or baptism done without water. Who would baptize without water? The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Not all Elka churches, 
But there was a movement when Elka was new. When did Elka start, by the way? Do you remember? 88. 87 forming, 88 is when they came to flower. Um, I, 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 in, in the early days of the ELCA, there was a movement to baptize with rose petals. What a beautiful picture to be baptized with rose petals. And then I can take little Sally's rose petals and keep them in a book and press them and she can have them forever. And is she baptized? No. So should she be baptized? Yes. Yeah. So there I would, I wouldn't even call it being baptized again then. I would just say, you haven't been baptized at all. I may have told you this story before. Um, and an elderly man in our congregation came to me, uh, this is many, many years ago, 15 years ago, who said, Pastor, I don't think that I've been baptized. And have I told you about this guy? Um, but he said, um, my parents are dead and the, the, oh, the, and the church burned where I was baptized. They don't have any records. All their records got burned and destroyed. So no one can prove if I was baptized. Would you baptize me again? And should I have baptized him? I did something else instead. I said, oh, that's, what were your parents' names? And he told me his parents' names. And I said, do you remember your grandparents' names? And he did as many people can do. He, he, he knew the grandma and grandpa who lived close by, he knew their first names. But the other pair of grandparents, he only knew grandma's first name and not grandpa's first name. You know, uh, so he knew grandma Tollefson was Dorothy, but grandpa Tollefson was grandpa Tollefson. And I say, and I said, oh, do you know some of your aunts and uncles? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who is your godmother? Oh, Aunt Marie Lee. So through diagonal th thinking, what did I just do? I proved his baptism. If you have a godmother, you were baptized. And he said, oh. And I said, but, but he said, but she's dead. And I said, it doesn't matter. She saw your baptism. She was a wit. That's why you called her your godmother. And he said, yeah, she used to send me $5 for every birthday. And I said, that's what every godparent should do, is send you five bucks for your birthday. But, I, but that, she was a witness to the baptism. That's what it's for. Um, um, I want to come to this. We're, we're not going to be able to finish the chapter, but baptism normally done by a pastor is normally done by a pastor as part of his divine call, which is to administer the sacraments and the means of grace. But it can be done in an emergency by any Christian. Now, in modern times, childbirth itself does not constitute an emergency. And we must be careful that newly created family traditions do not contradict the doctrine of the divine call. We're getting more and more families that have begun to say, but our other two babies we baptized in the hospital, therefore we have to baptize this one ourselves in the hospital. And I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about that, um, not because it's not the means of grace, it is still the means of grace, but because of this. And until COVID, I didn't have a good example. Now I have a great example with the other sacrament because during COVID we were getting phone calls here at St. Paul's. Well if I can baptize my family in an emergency why can't I give them the Lord's Supper in an emergency? You know or why can't I commune myself at home? I've got a graham cracker and I've got I don't have any wine pastor but I've got orange juice and so you see people even contradicting the elements of the Lord's Supper. And, uh, but our church's position on the Lord's Supper is clear. The called servant of the church should administer the sacrament. And if he needs an assistant, he can call with a temporary call an assistant to help. Um, but with baptism, uh, we, we do want the, the ministers to baptize. And in the service, especially the service, so the congregation can participate and see it happening. That takes us to the end of verse 6, and we'll uh, pause there and come back next time. Um, until then, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.